My first thought, if I may say, um, was when I was listening to these four excellent presentations that um, something Thomas Filk already started, maybe he can read my mind, that what if we should start, or could, would start to move towards a new um, channel, a new generation of, of curriculum, curricula. So, uh, so often I have the feeling, what a pity that this is not seen and heard by a lot of students, PhD or MA students in, in physics, mathematics, chemistry, sociology, history, and so on and so forth. And we have a not so secret, very ambitious effort create a completely new kind of interdisciplinary um, uh, and international doctoral school. More for practitioners and then ju just then theoretical um, kind of people. Or a mixture of, of them would be the best. I'm, I don't want to talk too much about this now, but I think what we saw, what we experienced is a kind of a slow or not so slow emergence of a new kind of paradigm, a new kind of knowledge, which is not yet crystallized, but um, the effort is clear. So thank you again uh, for the great uh, lectures and the word, the floor is yours. Who starts? Klaus, Klaus, of, uh, here. I have a question to uh, Thomas Felix's uh, presentation. One of your messages was to call for more and better and deeper science communication. The scientists, both social scientists and natural scientists, need to get out of their ivory towers and talk to the people. And uh, this is uh, the whole uh, emphasis on the enlightenment function of uh, science. Except uh, there are three problems. Uh, how do you make sure that people will listen? Uh, listening to scientists, particularly to people who do not belong to your own discipline can be cognitively demanding. It's hard to follow them sometimes, but that is the smallest problem. A second problem is that um, natural scientists often do not agree about the consequences to be drawn from their findings. My favorite example is I'm watching this for 30 years now. And my favorite example is disputes among geologists. Is this piece of salt rock certain to be immune from for, uh, outside external water for a million of years so that we can use it as a deposit for nuclear waste. Very, very simple, very relevant question. Geologists seem to disagree on particular locations in, in the salt. And this disagreement is the second uh, reason why the trust in and attention for uh, scientific findings uh, tend to be limited. I mean, the supply is great, but the demand is uh, lacking. And the third point, perhaps the most serious one, is that people are interested in scientific results, or what they think are scientific results, which appeal to uh, emotions, such as fear or hope. And uh, uh, there is a demand for scientific messages or pseudo-scientific messages that cater to this need for magical thinking and irrational uh, uh, assumptions. 
and uh, I think that is uh, a reason why some of the pseudoscientists are so successful in selling their books, and some of the real scientists are not. Thank you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so concerning your three points, I mean, I completely agree. Um, first point, uh, would people listen? Um, well, I think we face that problem in school uh, already. Can we people motivate to listen? Can we really make clear that it is there? Uh, well, in principle, also life, which we influence with our signs, and so that it is um, relevant for them. Not relevant in uh, like you have to sit down here in school. It's more relevant like you want to go to a movie because you're interested in the movie. And the question is, can we present signs in a way that it becomes interesting for people, that people want to know better? And I think this is one of the things where scientists are very, very bad in, in particular the real scientists, uh, <coughs> in, in, in quotation marks, I should say, in particular those who have been trained to do research and to use m formula and mathematics as their language. And what I'm always, what I always find lacking in, in many of my colleagues, and presumably to a certain extent also, of course, in, in myself, is can I simplify things in such a way that people understand what I'm going to say uh, without representing it wrong? So to simplify without making it wrong is an art, and this is not taught in universities particularly not to future researchers. And I think this is something which is lacking. Uh, the second thing is scientists always will dis disagree on certain things. That's natural. I think that's not only in the natural sciences, not only in geology or in physics. Uh, <coughs> I think everybody accepts it, that it's also in, in politics and the social sciences. So why not in the natural sciences? I think we should also communicate this and not pretend that science is, let's say, a fixed ontology which everybody has to believe. But we should make clear why we believe in, in certain results and make clear that certain results are disputable. Yes. But I think there are many, let's say, fundamental things which people can agree on. And some things, yes, we have to uh, admit, we do not know the detailed answers. We have not enough knowledge yet in order to really decide this or that is presumably true. And the third was related to fear. But yes, met, right. Um, <coughs> well, we had this discussion in Kursek also a lot of times. Um, I'm giving there a course on quantum theory and um, to social scientists. And um, I have the feeling, not so much in Kursek, but when I see also when I'm uh, searching in the internet, people think that physics or so can bring the answers to all the questions. In particular, quantum theory can answer all, this, all the questions, and this is not true. I mean, we are very, very limited in what we really can say. We can only try to, to um, <coughs> communicate essentially what we know, and in particular, quantum mechanics is not some magic which can solve all the problems. And I think this is part of the things we have to, to teach or we have to, to explain to, to the world, to everybody. Uh, I think that in this communication, the big problem is that when we want to sell our results to the outside world, it is very strongly correlated with fighting for money. And this sometimes introduces very strange irregularities. Let me tell one example. It was the su uh, superconductive super collider, an extremely large accelerator which was planned in the United States. Uh, when the main proposer 
uh, made his statement in the Senate of the United States, he made the following statement. If we build this accelerator, we are going to pro solve the problem of cancer. I don't want to mention the name. The person was a Nobel Prize winner, an excellent physicist, head of the Fermilab in Batavia in the US, and he had the courage to make such a strange statement. The result, uh, I spoke with the, the senator of Texas where this, uh, this, this accelerator was planned to be built before the decision was made. And she boasted, this is a fantastic thing. We are going to solve part of the big problems of the United States. We shall do it and Texas will, will go up on the level, on the rank of American states against the others. Uh, and then, uh, the, somehow it still happened that this project was canceled. And I spoke with the president of the American Physical Society after this decision, who was not a particle physicist, but a condensed matter physicist. And he said, thanks God, the, the SSC program has been canceled. So I just uh, mentioned this as an illustration that to sell our results is sometimes correlated or poisoned by our fight for money for our research. Uh, but the other thing is, what I want to mention that if we are really we want to sell our results to the public, there are chances. Let me mention that almost 20 years ago, we started a program in this country, which we called the University of Omni Sciences. It was a series of lectures in one of the largest university lecture hall, with 600 people, I think, there. It was a 45-minute lecture, and after that, 45 minutes question and answer. And this was broadcasted almost directly by several TV channels. Newspapers were writing it. It was a fantastic success. Uh, let me tell that I went to a theater, and I put my, my coat to the wardrobe. And when I, after the, after the concert, went to, for my, my coat, the lady there said, is it possible that you gave a lecture at University of Omni Sciences? Oh, this was fantastic. So I think the chance is there, but we have to be modest, and we should mix our drive for money with our intention to sell uh, our results to the public. I, I was triggered in the first place by Thomas's oxymoron teaching quantum physics to social scientists. So let me leave that one lying on the table. But um, in response to Klaus Tupfer's uh, very pertinent questions, I, I, my, I, I have two names and then an observation. The first is Feynman, the second is Karl Popper, and the third is Lowenstein and Camera and a whole lot of people who have uh, written on neuroeconomics. So on the first, Feynman had this famous observation, and this was a fellow who did succeed in popularizing science. Uh, five easy pieces and half a dozen other little books like that had a fairly transformative effect, at least on the west coast of the United States, in terms of attracting interest into exceedingly abstruse forms of quantum physics. But he had a cliche that I heard him repeat probably six times. If I can't explain it to a Caltech sophomore, I don't understand it myself. And that insight, the insight that enables the abstract of a scientific paper to be both intelligible and accurate, the insight that enables a policy brief to a president or a chief executive of a Fortune 500 company to be rendered in one page and still be accurate is the essence of this communication. Reliance on jargon, hedging bets in terms of semantics is a guarantee of having no impact uh, in respect of everything. So that's the Feynman one. Popper, if a scientific statement is not capable of falsification, it is not a scientific statement. So by definition, there will always be disagreement. And I think Thomas has said well that one has to phrase 
the statement with the appropriate level of certainty. And at the same time, not fall back on jargon in terms of high levels of probability, low levels of probability, etc., which quite frankly, nobody understands anyway. And then the third observation is I'd simply make the proposition that we are driven inherently as organic mammals, but as humans specifically, by fear, by want, and on a slightly smaller scale, although it is more advanced in women, by empathy. So those three phenomena, fear, want, both in respect of lust and in respect of greed, and social empathy, are the drivers of human behavior. There's no point getting excited about that. And the ability to be able to communicate appropriately within those parameters is central to ensuring that ideas will find traction or will find acceptance uh, in social terms. Yes. I think communication, communicating good science, latest science, to a wide public is essential. But we mustn't mix communicating the details and the at uh, some the latest kind of findings which are subject to Popper's falsification uh, and communicating the uh, essential aspect. And the essential aspect is usually a philosophical framework, is what it, not so much what it says about the world, but what it excludes. For example, about quantum physics, we can say so many things that this quantum physicist says, but what Bohm says, what uh, uh, John Green says, and etc. But they are all somewhat, somewhat different, and they'll be fighting with each other, sort of, which is true. But they agree on a, on a common framework, and the common framework can be very well defined in terms of what it is not. It's not a Newtonian framework. It's not a local realism. It's not a deterministic framework, etc. So, to un for the public, I think to understand where science is going is to is to understand what kind of a world picture we are projecting in in science, because that is the basis for cre for further creativity in science and application that we can apply of the science um, of natural science even to society. It's the framework, it's the basic assumptions, it's the, let's say it's the paradigm. You know? So we have to distinguish what we want to communicate, what it is. A worldview is being created today. It's a different worldview, although it comes back a little bit to the worldview of the 2000 year, years ago in some many respects, but it is very different from the classical worldview that is still dominant in, in, in society and, and, and mainstream science. So to be able to get that across, that there is a new worldview which is likely to be more correct than the dominant one. I think that's the major idea to communicate. And then we can still continue our internal discussions about how to specify this in terms of mathematics, in terms of, of its, if its applications to different particular fields. But what is undoubtedly true that there is a very different picture of reality surfacing at the edge, at the leading edge of the natural sciences. And that's what's relevant, I think, to society. Thank you very much. More questions? Professor Ferdinand um, Chabai and then Professor Bogart. Okay. Thank you. Hello. Oh, there we go. Thank you all, number one, for the wonderful presentations and then for the response to the question. I'd like to take two pieces. First, I'll take a small anecdote, which is that I had the great privilege at the Aspen Center for Physics of being across, sharing an office with David Bohm and being across the hall from Dick Feynman. And the interesting thing is that with Dick Feynman, Heinz Pagels, I don't remember a single conversation about our research, but I remember many conversations about learning, education, and communicating. And I learned a great deal from that. That happened to be, unintentionally on my part, but it happened to be the year, particularly, well, two years, before I became a deputy director of the Exploratorium Science Museum in San Francisco with Frank Oppenheimer, brother of Jay Robert, which was an interesting experience. Um, but given that one, one point that 
Feynman made repeatedly is that he considered his remarkable set of volumes on lectures in physics a failure. And I said, what do you mean it's a failure? It's fantastic. I loved it. He said, because for most of, even the Caltech undergraduates, they couldn't really use it. That it wasn't accessible appropriately. Now, on the other hand, many of us have used it, have learned from it, but not in the way that he originally envisioned. That said, let me maybe frame this in a very different way, the, the broader question. That was just a response to Feynman in particular. I think what we need to think about in the communication is less about what we want to tell people, hand out to them, get them to hear and listen to, and rather, how do we stimulate their curiosity, their questions, and then provide them with a way to nourish that curiosity. So rather than asking, why don't they listen? Why do they accept magical thinking, etc.? What are the questions that drive them? How do we stimulate that? And one of the ways that we can do that very effectively, I spent 20 years designing learning environments for 230 museums around the world, Disney, NASA, you name it. Um, one of the ways is to use cognitive dissonance. And that is a, has a very specific aspect with regard to magical thinking. Because people do have magical thinking. If you don't know how it happens, human, humanity throughout our history in, in, you know, invokes magical thinking. It, it must be because the sky's blue today, um, or whatever. That's fine if you give them a way then to begin to test ideas rather than simply to accept them. And I think that's where the communication is really difficult but essential. That is to start from the questions, which is the way we do science after all. If you can't pose the question well, you can't do good science. I don't care who you are. And so why should that not be the way we engage with people? The last point just to make that I'm at the Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies in Potsdam, part of, in the other part in Arizona State University, and one of the key ideas is how do we really engage in interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary research, which is to say how do we engage the populations who are affected by the things we think about in thinking about their own futures, plural, because it's in their context. Leave it there. I, I just want to respond on the Feynman thing very quickly. The, the paradox about where he was thinking, I can only really speak about the 80s. I spent some time with him in 82, 83. But the paradox in his mind at that particular point in time, which you've well illustrated, was expressed one evening in a greasy spoon, fiddling around with bongo drums, and he spent a disproportionate amount of his time doing things like that at that point. And he got very irritated with me because I couldn't understand something he was explaining to me. And he said, uh, you're stupid. You, 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 you're not understanding what I'm saying. He'd had a little bit to drink. And, and I said, well, you know, one of the other things that you pointed out, apart from your famous Caltech sophomore observation, was that unless one has the language of higher mathematics, one cannot understand the current state of theoretical physics, which is, of course, true. And that's the dilemma in this particular regard, and that's why the lectures were such a frustration to him in that particular regard, because people who didn't have the language of higher mathematics in which those lectures were constructed did not find them accessible. But, but, but that's, in a certain sense, the lesser point. I, the challenge, it seems to me, for science is twofold. One, I, I totally agree with magical thinking as a, as a reference point in terms of making thought accessible. 
But the second challenge, and that I think is what we're trying to grapple with today at least, and perhaps tomorrow as well, is how one makes scientific insight accessible to policymakers as well. And there, one isn't dealing with curiosity. One is dealing with the necessity to transfer insight to enable a degree of policy interface. And that's th the most difficult thing, I think. In public discourse, a number of public intellectuals, from Sagan through Martin Rees in a certain sense, Attenborough in a different realm, have succeeded in doing exactly what you describe and made science extremely accessible in that fashion. But when you're sitting in front of the Bundeskanzler, or when you're sitting in front of the Prime Minister, or when you're sitting in front of the Chancellor of the Exchequer, and you need to get an insight across, this is a different challenge, and I think it may be worth our thinking about how that challenge can be addressed as well. Just, just one point to, educa to education. Uh, I think our responsibility uh, working in science is to try to at least minimally educate those who make the decisions afterwards. I think the best thing is to teach them in the, uh, on the level that they should be able to understand the options what we are opposing them so that they, it should be easy for them to, to select. Let me tell an example, uh, of the ne a negative example. In one of the European countries, there was a debate in Parliament on the extension of the lifetime of nuclear power stations. And there was a debate, a very strong debate. The decision was absolutely positive. But one of the members of Parliament made the following statement. As we all know, radioactive isotopes decay in 500 years. After that, they start halving. Now, uh, you may understand the stupidity of this, but if the decision maker is on this level, then we should not be surprised if the decision is not according to our taste. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. About, <clears throat> about communicating, I think one of the presuppositions of meaningful communication about frontline science, anyway, is the is the selection or this choice that Einstein put. He said there are two ways to live your life, as if everything is a miracle or as if nothing is. There is no progress to be made if nothing is a miracle. If you already know everything, or if you know only just something is missing and you put that into position, then you know everything. You know, uh, then there is no, no, no sense of, of pursuing science. It becomes something quite mechanical. So this mindset of approaching the world as something miraculous, uh, almost magical, is, is very basic uh, to science. Uh, there is an interesting argument, uh, now this more and more put forward, even by scientists, that there are very, very many miraculous, magical elements in contemporary science. There's a book published a couple of months ago by Dean Radin of the uh, Institute of Noetic Sciences. It's, it's called entitled Real Magic, you know, Real Magic. Yeah. You know? yeah. It makes a point that uh, there is so much in science which is not comprehensible with the ordinary mindset. And if you're not open to that, you know, the, you, will, you will not be open to, to understanding science. New science is practically miraculous in many respects. And it's the spirit, I think, that was there in Einstein, in, in Jung, in Feynman, almost the searching for the, the, the incomprehensible, the making it comprehensible, not by kneeling it down, but trying to grasp what it is, because it's far, far more than our everyday reality. And that's the sense of adventure. Uh, like Whitehead's little book is called The Adventure of Ideas. Science is an adventure of ideas. And to co communicate that, I think, is to communicate the spirit of science, which is much more important even than the letter of science. Thomas? Um, yes, Janos and um, the Professor Czernay. Thank you very much. Uh, if I look back to these four excellent presentations, 
I believe to find one common statement, change is to happen, change is inevitable, change is might be already happening. Now, change is something different. If I listen to the German political credo, it states stability. No change, stability. So how do you imagine change based on your experience, based on your historical knowledge? Will it be or is it possible to be evolutionary? Is revolutionary or even chaotic, catastrophic? Where we end up, I do not ask because therefore the whole day won't be enough. <clears throat> well, my, my first comment would be that I think there's a difference between change and stability. I think you can have change with stability. And um, I'm also uh, research, doing research in neural networks, which is not so important what exactly it is. But it relates to something which Sean mentioned it's in his talk. And I was reminded of that. I can make very sparse, as they say, neural network. They can change, but they are very, very stable. And the more dense I make them, the more instable they become. But the change is more or less the same. Both networks behave very similar when it only comes to adaptation or so. But one network is very instable. A single change in the network and everything explodes. And the other types of networks are stable. So I think the only thing I want to mention is that I think change and stability is not a contradiction. And uh, I was reminded of Sean's talk when off of these results, which come from simulations of neural networks. Yeah, I, so first of all, I, I, I agree completely in respect of that. So, uh, in other words, th this goes back to the, uh, the greater the level of connectivity in a system, the higher the number of potential outcomes associated with that system. And that's the challenge of the moment. We've created a phenomenal degree of connectivity which makes any form of prediction in respect of outcomes infinitely more difficult than would be the case otherwise. But, but you asked a specific question, and let me now put on a social science hat, for want of a better phrase, and offer you an historical perspective in respect of it. One way of thinking about that in social terms is to say that revolutionary change, fundamentally disruptive change, occurs when institutions prove incapable of adapting to the rapidity and scale of social, economic, and technological changes. So when the institutions, which are by definition fairly stable, significantly static, characterized by high degrees of institutional inertia in many cases, are confronted with scale and speed in terms of rapidity of change, they usually fracture. So if you think about European history very quickly, 1555 Treaty of Augsburg after the Catholic Lutheran War, 1648 Westphalia after the Thirty Years' War and the extension, uh, 1814, 1815 the Congress of Vienna after the Napoleonic Wars, 1919 Treaty of Versailles after the First World War, and Bretton Woods and San Francisco and related institutions after the turmoil of the Second World War. Under those circumstances, what you're looking at is an inability of institutional adaptation in the context of significant levels of change leading to catastrophic outcomes, and then following that reconstruction premised on new insights, which were always apparent to certain elites prior to the catastrophe, but did not, in fact, bring about the elimination of institutional inertia. For the rest of it, I'm with Heraclitus. Change is a fundamental dimension of continuous existence, everything. All of us will leave this discussion in 15 minutes' time changed by it. At least I hope so. If not, we're not capable of learning. It is, it is inherent in everything that we do. So 
the fundamental issue is whether one is capable in the spirit that Laszlo is offering in terms of his construct of anticipating likely outcomes associated with catastrophic disruption in advance and developing enough of a consensus to overcome institutional inertia so as to reconfigure institutions in a manner that is fit for purpose. In historical terms, it hasn't happened very often. Uh, physics gives a very simple example how this should be, could be made. In physics, if a system is stable, it means it is sitting in a potential well and it always returns to its stability until you don't get above the threshold. So uh, this has to be transferred into social issues. It is not so easy. It needs mostly uh, many uh, detailed analysis. Sometimes even the solution cannot be found, and then you have revolutions. In a way, science is antithetical to change. And we were trying in science to conceive change as not novelty, but as, as invariance under transformation. You know, if we don't find the invariance underlying a change process, and we don't understand it. And if, if we find it, then we, have a, uh, then, then, then we look for it. In other words, then when we don't find it, then we look for it, until ultimately we find the invariance, and then the invariance explains the change process, you know. So ultimately, uh, we are looking for, for stability in the Einsteinian sense also. Yeah. Understand what the, the change as being a, just a transformation of an invariance, you know, nothing new. Uh, but there are limits to what we can accommodate as where we can find the invariance that is being transformed in a given change process then we have to look for a higher level, a higher level of invariance, ultimately, until we find cosmic or cosmological constants that can explain the processes. You know. so that's the theoretical ideal, in a way. But within that, the everyday change process, everyday change process is something that is, that is a challenge because it's antithetical to the, to the whole uh, enterprise of science. The science is trying to understand and to understand it as something which is already there, something which exists, which is already manifested in many different ways and different times. So the, the spirit is of, of finding uh, the, the, the magical, the, the, the miraculous, ultimately is always in confrontation with the spirit of finding the stability, finding what is there, finding what is invariant. And we have, we have both of them. You know, we have to have a tolerance for, for change in the sense of not everything is there that we understand. We don't understand everything. And that is the limit. That is then the ideal, trying to understand more of it, but still understanding more of it, not in the sense today, at least in the new quantum disciplines, of something that determines, something that's given, pre-given, but it's something that is potential, something that's possible to envisage a world where a lot of things are possible, potential, even if you don't understand it, including certain processes of change. It's a different mindset. Excellent. Professor Czernay. So I first have a very brief comment regarding the communication of uh, scientific results and then a question to uh, Sean Cleary and uh, uh, Erwin Laszlo. Uh, the comment is that, uh, as it was indirectly mentioned by Norbert Crow, it's important that the person who communicates to the public the scientific result is the author itself. If a third person, like a director of some huge institution or a direction of some intergovernmental panel of some even larger constitution communicates, he has no responsibility directly. He changes the numbers to emotional words, and then maybe the result of that communication is actually to the contrary of the original result. So we have to be very careful there. Okay, my question is regarding these changes. Um, and in both uh, presentations, what I heard, uh, 
uh, in the present or future development of uh, society or political organization, there should be some ideal co collaboration globally to the advantage of everybody, and every, uh, every single person agrees with that. But then, how do we reach to this stage, and how can we decide that if a given organization or step or any action in that direction is the right one? So I wanted to ask, what do you think about the role of competition in the earlier development of the Earth and the increasing complexity, competition had actually the decisive role, which system is survivable, which system can be continued, which is the best and most optimal. But I, I think that was not included in none of these two presentations, so I would like to have some how do you see at discussion. I'll give you a pragmatic response to it, because I'm not sure that there is uh, an ideal response, a response that uh, would stand scrutiny from every dimension. We need the level of cooperation that avoids a catastrophe. We don't need a level of cooperation that involves the subordination of individual identities, national identities, or preferences. There is quite a useful construct that was developed by a chap called Hedley Bull um, back in the 90s, which simply said that a global society is a gathering of states that recognizing common interests agrees to subordinate themselves to certain collective rules to achieve outcomes that are preferable to the alternative. Now, that's a very pragmatic statement in respect of it. What that constitutes, what level of integration, what level of subordination of notional sovereignty is a function for negotiation at the end of the day. But the first instance is that there has to be a recognition of the desirability of an opportunity for collective action to avoid catastrophic outcomes. Now, whether you think of that in terms of Garrett Hardin's tragedy of the commons, which, by the way, has just been revisited on a different scale, and is, the new paper is quite interesting, but whether it's that or whether it is aspirational in the context, for example, of the European Union, the idea that constructing a European identity would prevent the outbreak of two catastrophic wars that defined the 20th century and produced terror, which I suppose is where Monet came from in the first instance in respect of this, that's, that's in the political realm. There's no intrinsic answer to that question. I think if you trample on the sense of identity of either individuals or subnational or national entities at any particular point in time, you breed the instability that Thomas explores in neural networks. It's, it's, a, it's a foolish errand uh, in the context of the creation of an ideal. If you take, I'm going to be provocative now in respect of Europe, the Europe of the six was perfectly logical. The Europe of the nine, almost entirely logical. The Europe of the 12 was already stretching it. The Europe of the 15 was only possible because of surplus. The Europe of the 25 was wishful thinking. I don't mean it wasn't a good idea in the context. It may have been but it was aspirational. There was no institutional underpinning, there wasn't a normative underpinning, there wasn't a coherent sense of collective identity, and hence it displayed stress and fracture. So I, I started out by saying I was going to give you a pragmatic answer. I sincerely trust that Luzler will give you a, an aspirational answer in respect of it. Uh, we have to navigate uh, between these parameters. I would just like to differentiate between constructive and destructive competition. Destructive competition would be competition for one's own interests, for one's own good, 
which possible consequences means decoherence in the system within which that competition takes place. If it destroys the overall system, that competition, no matter how much it is good for the, for the individual competitor, is destructive. Contemporary politics, big power politics, is of that kind of competition. It competes for its own interests, and in the process, it destroys the coherence of the system within which it occurs. So competition has to respect the, the, the overall coherence of the system in which, it, in which it takes place. This is not a limitation of, of, of competition. It's just a specification of its utility. It's useful, yes, if you compete. And the result of the competition is coherence, both the intrinsic kind whereby the system of the competitor is co becoming more coherent and the extrinsic kind within which the environmental system within which competition takes place becomes coherent, more coherent at the same time. So competition is not, a, a, to my mind, is not a goal in itself. It's a subsidiary useful mechanism for increasing the coherence of systems. That may be very uh, unsatisfactory for people who look at competition as the motor but competition is actually a very useful thing, but has to be kept within the bounds. And the bounds is what's good for the competitor and good for all competitors, including the environment. That's good competition. I agree that first, the results have to be sold professionally on the first level, but there has to be a next level which is more integrating, but it also has to be professional. But my other remark is connected with something else. Namely, we have to learn the language of those who accept our proposals. Let me tell one example. When we were starting the European Research Council, uh, the head of the research activity DG Research Director General in Brussels, didn't like the idea because he knew that if this starts, then he loses money. Uh, and uh, seemingly that was important in that circles. Uh, we, were this, we, we, we tried to convince him. It didn't work until one se sentence was said. Uh, and this is connected with competition. Uh, I told that uh, if competition is shifted from the national level to the European level, this automatically leads to the improvement of quality, and this is a European added value, this is a politician's slang, and at that moment he opened his, his purse and said, okay, it should go. And now, it was an example, maybe a primitive one, but it, it showed that uh, we cannot be in the IRA tower, tower alone. We have to learn the way of thinking or the language of the other side of the barricade in order to be able to be successful. Excellent. Now, uh, one more question, and then we are going to change a little bit the time frame. Okay, please introduce yourself. My name is Shanda uh, A short question. I would be interesting uh, you expect a good communication from the scientists but the whole uh, organization of science uh, beginning with the universities uh, are based on that scientists want to talk to scientists and nothing else and they are educated to be without any uh, uh, anything uh, else without the outside world, only analyzing, proving, and so on. So there is a difference between the skills and also the motivation. Uh, scientists are simply uh, focused on the on, uh, on small world and not on the, uh, the outside. Maybe a question, this is why what I ask is asking every day from ourselves and from other people. Who starts? We are in the building of the Hungarian Academy of Science of Music. Uh, and one of our big composers was Zoltan Kodai. And he was asked when 
the music education of children should be started. And the response was at the minus nine months. So it, uh, probably at minus nine is too early for science, but it has to be started very early. The way of scientific thinking and so on uh, is a, a must to be started early. Yeah, well, when you just made your comment, um, <clears throat> it reminded me of um, Picasso's. I don't know whether it's true or not. He said, we are all born as artists. The problem is to remain one when we grow up. And I think it's similar with science and it's similar with almost everything. When we are born or as young kids, we are curious about everything and we lose that curiosity. And I completely agree with you that many of my colleagues in the university, they don't want to talk to, to the public in a sense. They are, want to talk to their peers, they want to, to discuss things, to, to solve the problems which they have on their tables, and uh, <coughs> to go to conferences where they can talk to peers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I have the feeling that slowly, slowly people figure out that it is important, for instance, also to give to educate good teachers in a university. Not only good researchers, but also good teachers. The question is, can we really, <coughs> uh, can we change the system within the university to an extent that, let's say, to be a good teacher is part of the qualifications you must have in order to become a university professor? Um, some years ago, I think, 40 years ago, when I was in the first, um, uh, <coughs> took part in, let's say, uh, um, the pro professor being hired or getting a call, uh, what was important at that time were the number of publications. So they looked at the number of publications, 200, wonderful, 200, that must be an excellent scientist. So he was the one, appeared number one on the list. Some years later, they started to introduce education as part of the qualifications, but somehow then, I don't know which system, policy or what forced us to find a new criterion, which is now important, that is how many money can you bring into the university from a third, from companies or from whatever. So this is the most important qualification today, and I think this is the wrong direction. I, should, I think teaching good way of teaching should be, become more important. Can I just throw one remark in? I, I, I think what has been said in response and the question that you posed are absolutely correct. I think they're the fundamental obstacles to science being able to play its proper role in social transformation ahead of catastrophe. I only make one observation. It's been said several times, Laszlo said it three times in the course of this morning, that companies are required to serve a social purpose. And that construct has been phrased in English as social license, a license to operate. I would argue that scientists and those in academic practice should think too about their social license to operate. If it is exclusively within the ivory tower, perhaps that is not a sufficient license. Yes, that's precisely the point I'd like to make. Uh, the academic world forces scientists to be technicians, to be specialists. To my mind, what the Germans call the Fachwissenschaftler is not really a Wissenschaftler. It's not really something to do with knowledge. You know. But the public mind looks at scientists as something who does something techno technological. I mean, it's, it's a good technician, it's, that's, that's what the scientist is. A scientist who asks fundamental questions and challenges things and asks for people to clarify their own views that's, that's not science. It's not even philosophers, because philosophers have also been pushed into a technical role. You know, you have to examine one particular doctrine and find something in it and then put something else in its place. So the role of really what in the Greek sense was the wise man, was the philosopher, 
is not being played, not being filled in, con in the contemporary world. So we should really find at least some part of what we call scientists, call it theoretical scientists, call it holistic scientists, general scientists, whatever, one who raises fundamental questions and tries to give answers that are, go beyond the specialty in which it is. Then I think we would have people whom we could turn to for these questions, because the technician will only give you preconceived answers. Becoming more and more exciting, uh, but, um, but maybe, maybe we can avoid lunch, you know, that is... Uh... Hello, uh, my name is Zehra Seyes from Istanbul Sabancı University. I come from a physics background and I turned into biology, biophysics, and then I'm now also very deeply involved in education. In all, all of you, what you said, you just, I think in the last minute, referred to something very important, which is technology. I mean, we've been talking about science, but technology is a very big part of our life. In fact, that touches everybody and that connects to everybody. We use it all the time. So that is a way, actually, uh, that, to my mind, wrongly, science has been communicated to the society. Really, what is communicated directly to the society is technology, and that's also where it comes, like fighting for money. You know, why do you, why do you defend your science? You're not defending your science, really, at that point. You're defending technology. You're defending something that you're going to sell and turn into a product. Where there, whereas there are a lot of fundamental points in science which we have to be discussing if we're going to face this complex structure that it seems to be, uh, well, it's not only coming to us, and I think we are in it. So I think that's a very good point. Thank you. May, may I suggest? Um, yes, we are 15 minutes um, um, behind our limits. Uh, if, if we can stop now, we can come back sh and start sharp at 2. And that means we have a little delay, and then we keep this wonderful um, discussion and your questions for for the other day, for days, on the third day and Sunday. I hope we are going to have um, a wrapping up debate. Um, and I myself, I'm signed, I restrict myself. I have very many comments, um, but I kindly would like to ask you to think also about possible suggestions, how to realize, maybe maybe small steps, as was mentioned by most of the speakers. You can't solve everything with one big jump in sciences or in the academia or in universities. But there are efforts, there are good examples. Um, we can give you a few of them. Um, and we would like to ask the whole audience to join in a, com in a debate, in a, in a common thinking, how to go further from here. Yeah? Because that is a kind, but what is happening here for me now is knowledge creation. And it's co-creation. It's not because we have five or ten geniuses and all the others are just listening to them and taking notes. It's because you can feel in the room that new ideas are, if not completely Professor Crow, you wouldn't you would miss my you know suggestions to you. No, no, yeah, no, just, just, yeah. <laughs> just just kidding. Um, that there is something in this co-creation which I think is missing from our academic systems, hugely. Maybe not everywhere. So if you have good examples, please collect them and and, and let us know about them.